morning and welcome to Coffee and Clergy. I'm Pastor Doug Chinberg. And I'm Pastor Scott Pitch. We're glad to have you with us today. As we uh, march forward in our series, The Elephant and the Donkey in the Room, we're talking about American politics and its intersection with Christ's commands in the church. Uh, today we're going to talk about the issues that God cares about, specifically the issues that he speaks on in his word and how we as Christians are called to follow uh, his lead when he speaks in his word. And also we'll talk a little bit about Christian freedom, what we do when God doesn't specifically speak on an issue that we're called to uh, voice an opinion on. So uh, glad to have you for episode three. We got one more episode next week and we'll be wrapping up our series then. But before we uh, get into the episode today, let's go ahead and open in a prayer and we'll invite, invite God to be with us today. Heavenly Father, I give thanks today that you have called us to be your people, that you have given us clear instruction, not just to point to you, your son, Jesus Christ, which is the most important word that we have from your scripture, but also you give us guidance for how we're to conduct ourselves as your people each and every day. And so we give you thanks today as we look in your word for some some answers about ways you would have us to uh, voice our opinion, ways you would have us to act in this world. We pray that, ho that your Holy Spirit will make uh, clear for us what your word commands so that we can follow and obey it. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So uh, there are some issues that God is very clear about in Scripture, mm -hmm. and there's a, a passage that kind of sets the tone, and it's taken from Micah chapter 6, verse 8. And uh, I'll go ahead and read that, and uh, this will kind of set the tone as we begin our discussion today. It says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And so there's some, some clear examples of how God would have us live. And so one, one question is, uh, are Christians bound to, to the positions uh, that God has clearly spoken as we deal with different political issues? Uh, the short answer is yes. Okay. Um, we we uh, must obey God rather than men. That's the proclamation of the disciples when they're held to account before the religious leaders. They say as Christians, as followers of Christ, we are beholden to the will of God. Um, and when he speaks clearly in his word, uh, we don't get the ability to say, yeah, he, he may have said that back then, but today we believe this. That leads to all kinds of problems, um, in not just in our practice of, of religion, but in our everyday life. It's not according to God's uh, design specifications for how humans and human civilization is supposed to work. So when and in those moments that God speaks clearly on a topic, we are, we are bound to listen to that and to obey that. Yeah, I kind of peeked at our catechism before and getting ready for today's uh, discussion, and there uh, clear things that if we owe honor or respect to those in the governing authorities, we're to give them that honor and respect. Mm -hmm. If we're if we owe taxes, we're to pay taxes. If uh, we're to submit to the governing authorities, those are all very clear examples of how God would have us live, uh, no matter what kind of government we're mm -hmm. part of. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's some some clear positions that God wants us to live out in our life. But uh, what does the Bible say about justice and uh, a Christian's role in maintaining a just and equitable society? Yeah, so we're going to just to kind of lay out the structure of these next couple of questions. We're going to look at the Bible uh, on some of these issues where we have a very clear exhortation from God on how we're called to live our life. So the first uh, verse that I think leads us to this discussion on the topic of justice is Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. So I'll go ahead and read that passage. Um, it says, learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. And so we have this, this call by God to try and make this world a more just and equitable sort of society. Um, what that means and the levers by which that's done are open to some interpretation, but it is very clear that as Christians we can't just uh, look away and turn a blind eye when there's injustice in the world. We're called to be God's people at work to bring justice to those who are oppressed. Okay, very clear. Do what is right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, 
Uh, again, God's clear word is, is, is spoken, and that's a, an opportunity for all of us as we live in this world uh, uh, to follow him and encourage that justice that you were talking about. Uh, there's another passage from Matthew's gospel, Matthew yeah. chapter 19, and it talks about caring for the poor. And uh, Matthew 19, verses 21 to 24 uh, it says, Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for the camel to go through, the, through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So as we, we talk about the, the, uh, the poor in our society, uh, what does God say about how we should care for them? Yeah, so the context is always important when we read the word of God. So this is the context of the rich young man who comes to, to Jesus and tries to kind of justify himself before Jesus to a degree. And so Jesus goes to his one area of, of, of pretty need. profound <laughs> need and weakness even, where he needs to um, get rid of the, the wall that he's built between him and following Jesus, which he knows is his, his wealth and his possessions. God isn't calling every single Christian throughout all Christendom to sell all their possessions and give everything they own to the poor. But I brought these verses to the, to the front more for the latter part where it says, I tell you it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the reason why I think Jesus says this is because it is so common for people to allow um, idolatry of things, of ideas, of other um, goals that they want to set in life to block them from God, and our wealth can do that, certainly. And, and what really is damaging there is when we are so possessive of the things that we have that we refuse to reach out a hand of, of uh, help to those in need around us. And so when it comes to po the poverty-stricken, when it comes to widows and orphans, there's a pretty clear exhortation by God throughout his scripture that Christians are not just supposed to turn a blind eye and walk right past, but we're supposed to First of all, feel for those people who are going through difficulties and to do what's within our power reasonably to try to assist and help. So should we give money to those who are poor? Uh, yes, I think this is where your discernment can come in, right? Um, if, you, if you are um, in a car with your kids in the middle of downtown St. Louis, probably not wise to roll down your window and converse with a, a person on the side of the road that you don't know, but if it's, if it's you walking along the side of the road and there's a person who's asking for help to put food on the table, um, I think that that's, uh, I think that there, there's definitely an opportunity there for you to share the love of God with them yeah. by, by dropping a few dollars, by sharing a word, maybe even praying with them, um, saying that God is with them even in this hard time. It's a yeah. great opportunity to testify to someone in a difficult, difficult season of life. Yeah, one of the challenges uh, uh, that we face here at King of Kings is there, from time to time, we have people that come by and, mm -hmm. and are, are looking for help. Um, I guess our practice is not always to give money mm -hmm. because we know that um, people have not been honest at times and have gone and spent money on um, uh, alcohol or other things that when they said that they were hungry, mm -hmm. And so, or if they need gas in their car, we don't just hand them uh, thirty, forty dollars. We might go and and fill, fill their, their fill their gas tank. Or if they say they're hungry, we'll take them to the circle of concern bin and give them some food, um, or we'll direct them to uh, other areas that specialize in helping people with certain needs. So, someone's like, "I can't pay my rent this this week." We say, "Well, we don't have." Yeah you know, $700 to write a check to you so you can pay your rent, but we do support organizations that work with helping people who need rent assistance, and so we'll direct them to that. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, another people group within our society is those who are immigrants, mm -hmm. whether they're legal or illegal mm -hmm. immigrants. Uh, what does God say uh, about caring for such people? 
Yeah, uh, we don't have the status of illegal or legal immigrant in the Bible to speak of, but God does speak about what he calls sojourners, which are foreigners, people in the land um, that are not the people of Israel and how they are, to, how God calls the people of Israel to deal with them. So in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 and 34, um, it says, when an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Okay, again, some clear directions. Uh, Treat them as if they were one of your own people. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Sometimes that's hard to do uh, as you talk with immigrants. They come from a different background. They come from a different culture. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they speak a different language. And so sometimes it's a, it's a bit of a barrier to, to talk with them, to engage them. Um, but that's exactly what God invites and even calls us to do. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to draw a distinction line here between the idea of the aliens in your midst and how we treat them here and about overarching governmental policy regarding the influx of illegal immigrants into our nation. Because I think some of our listeners might hear you know, the words we've been speaking so far and think, well, anyone just comes in and does anything. We should welcome them. That's obviously been the source of some major problems, um, some, some, uh, some um, bad behavior, some criminal behavior, um, some things. I mean, if the first action you take when you enter into a country is you break the law, that sets the stage poorly for, for any kind of a future. But one of the things we do want to say is there is a there is a position for Christians as individuals to be the ones who can shepherd and care for uh, immigrant people once they're in our country. Whether they're illegal or legal, they're human beings, and we are called to treat them as one of our own. That's a very clear um, directive from God in Leviticus here. So. And, and, so, and there's a difference between welcome they, welcoming them in the house of God. Mm -hmm. Uh, We would welcome anyone in the house of God to pray with them, to talk with them, and um, welcoming, uh, again, someone from a different country into our country um, illegally. We Mm -hmm. want them to go through the proper channels. We want them to um, um, uh, be recognized not only by us, but by our government as they come in. in a, in a good and right and just way. And it's, it's one of those political issues where I don't think either side has a very clear way to handle this massive problem. Um, I think they have um, variations on the ways to address it, but it is an ongoing concern that's bigger than any law that can be passed. Um, and so we have to be careful as Christians how we speak about immigrants because I think so often um, we, we, our, our rhetoric makes it seem as if though we're anti-immigrant, and we're not. I would argue that the vast majority of us have immigrants in our ancestry. Not many of us are native to this land, and so um, we have to be cautious about how we speak about people who are here um, to not make it seem as if though we're against people who are not like us or don't speak the same way or believe the same way necessarily that we do. Yeah. We want to be, um, as Christian people, we want to be caring for those who are foreigners in our land. Yeah, we have opportunities. We have organizations that work with our Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, mm-hmm. um, one here in St. Louis that, we've, that our churches often worked with is Christian Friends of New Americans yep. and helping them speak English as a second language, helping them learn some basic skills and traits uh, helping them if they need clothes. Um, and Caring for their kids because most of those f- folks are holding down double, double jobs. Sh- shift jobs and their kids don't have a safe place to go at the end of the day, so they provide a place for their kids at the end of the day. Yeah, uh, so there are, there are many different opportunities within our church body and other church bodies yep. where we care for uh, the immigrants around us. Mm-hmm. Uh, an- another topic that is very near and dear to God's heart is one about life. Mm-hmm. And so there is a passage from Psalm 139 uh, that talks about life. And we want to read that as, um, as we talk about this issue from one, one, Psalm 139, verses 15 and 16. Yep, I can read that. <clears throat> My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of, of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. 
All the days ordained for me were written in your, in your book before one of them came to be. Um, and so I think you have here, um, well, it, there's a lot of topics related to life that we get to vote on or that are political positions. We've talked already a little bit about the abortion issue, but we can talk about it again here. I think these verses and many others show that God values life in the womb and so we, uh, and considers it to be human life. And uh, I think so that we have a fairly clear directive from our God that we too are to consider life in the womb to be human life. Therefore, to terminate that human life would be akin to murder. And so we don't, thou shalt not kill, um, very clear uh, Command commands from God. From God. Um, but, you know, this, these verses also touch on life beyond the womb, which is so often what Christians get accused of doing is we're not really pro-life, we're just pro-birth. And then once the kids are here, like, you know, do whatever you want with them, we don't care anymore. And nothing could be further from the truth as Christians. Uh, we value life in all of its from, from Ages in conception and to and grave, right? Yeah. And, and also another thing here it says is, uh, that I think is interesting is a topic which is really popular growingly so in, in uh, Europe and in Asia is this topic of euthanasia, um, that people should be able to determine the method and the timing of their own deaths. And as Christians, we would also say that's not for humanity to decide. That's a God thing. God has the days you know, that, that are numbered for us, laid out ahead of us. He's the one who decides when we begin and when we end, and we don't get to make that determination ourselves. And so uh, there's a couple of topics you could, you could talk about that all relate to um, how God is a God of life, not a God of death. Yeah. Um, there are some other issues that maybe we can touch base on as well. Um, sometimes people end up um, talking about the death penalty. Does that mean that God is against the death penalty? Some people might hold that opinion. Um, this, is, this one is kind of one of the more gray areas. God does say the government, one of the roles of the government is to wield the sword. And what that means is to have the authority to take life if it is justified based on uh, the law of the land or to protect the citizens of a country. So we can take up arms without loss of conscience um, to defend uh, our nation. We also call that just war. Just war. We can also uh, punish those who violate the laws of our society. Um, and even God would, uh, it, we have plenty of evidence from the Old Testament of that. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, plenty of evidence even in the New Testament. Whenever, um, for example, whenever Jesus was crucified, he was, it was sort of a farcical kind of a trial, but like the, the objection to that wasn't that, that he was um, killed uh, because um, there was no doubt that Pontius Pilate had the authority um, to, to pass a judgment of execution on a, a criminal. Matter of fact, you could even say it was just that the two men on either side of Jesus were justly being punished. crucified and punished, um, even though it's a brutal way to go. Um, you, you know, the, the law, the, the governing authorities have the sword, the right of God to enforce the laws. And so even in our own nation, we talk about the death penalty in certain areas. And um, I, th I would say that it's probably a good thing to do where we would say, um, we don't want to have cruel and unusual punishment. I, I agree that's probably not something that God wants us to do is to bring out the worst uh, sort of instincts of the human nature to try and punish We don't people. need to bring back crucifixion exactly. again. Exactly. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to bring back crucifixion. We don't need to, um, you know, um, any number of these execution styles that are designed to create maximum pain in death. Um, but, but there is the ability to wield the sword. Um, God, does, God does not withdraw that from the left-hand realm. That's a, a force and authority that they have. Okay. Uh, we want to go on to another area talking about civ civic responsibility. Mm -hmm. Again, there's a, a passage of Scripture that kind of sets the foundation taken from James chapter 1, verse 27. And here James says that religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself uh, unstained from the world. And um, so how do we do this? And uh, we're going to talk about um, um, having responsibility for those in the world around us, but we want to begin with a passage from Mark's Gospel in chapter 12, 
verses 28 through 31. All right, I'll uh, read that passage. Or do you go ahead. To, okay. I don't have it. I've got it here. Um, so this is uh, the greatest commandment, just to give the context of this. One of the teachers of the law came and heard uh, Jesus and others debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked, of all of the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So there's a a two-part responsibility. One in our relationship with God, to love him with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Uh, The other is in connection with our neighbor, to love our neighbor as ourself. Uh, I think also the passage that Jesus shared in the uh, Sermon on the Mount where he talked about treat others in the same way that you would like them to treat you uh, from Matthew chapter 7. To to use a little bit of theological language, um, I'll just introduce it. There's this idea of righteousness before God and righteousness before man. So we have like a a a vertical uh, type of righteousness that goes between us on the bottom and God up high. If you imagine a line. And that, that type of righteousness is called the quorum deo. It's this idea of we'll never be fully righteous before God, but Christ's righteousness given to us it makes us righteous before God. But there's also a righteousness, it's this different kind of righteousness, between us and the rest of the world, the rest of the people in the world with us. And this is called the quorum mundo, mundo meaning earth. And um, so it's this righteousness that we have between us and the people around us. And we have this, because we have that vertical quorum deo relationship of, of righteousness with God, we've been given a new purpose and a new life to live out the righteousness with man, that quorum mundo. And so we, have the, we do have responsibilities for our neighbors, for the widows and the orphans, for the people that we're called in our vocations to care for. And so Mark is basically showing this exact thing. Jesus says, love the Lord your God. That's the quorum deo, the up and down vertical righteousness. And then love your neighbor as yourself. That's the horizontal quorum mundo righteousness. Okay. Uh, So how are Christians called to be active participants in this civic realm of, of the world that we live in? First of all, to just be active in it, to consider yourself as a citizen of the nation that you live in with, with responsibilities to be a good steward of that and to have a vocation of citizen, um, to, to take on the responsibility of being someone who advocates for the well-being of the people around you, your community. Um, we don't get to be uh, miserly shut-in people who separate ourselves. We don't get to move to Montana and live out in the middle of nowhere and never interact with anybody. Um, as Christians, that's not our calling. We're meant to live in the world with the people that God has given us to care for in this yeah, world. Yeah, you, you mentioned that we're to be stewards of God. What does that mean? Stewards just means to be a caretaker, to take care of the things of God. Okay. Um, God has given you a life. He's given you the people around you as well as a gift to you, and he's given you as a gift to them. So you have to live in that relationship and be a good caretaker, a good steward of it. Okay, recognizing that God has given us everything that we have, Mm -hmm. and so how do we take care of those uh, ourselves, those around us, the material things that God has given Mm -hmm. us? uh, That becomes a lifelong challenge and activity as we care for the relationships that we're in and and for those around us. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so how do we balance, God has given us all these things to do, how do we balance the responsibilities of being an, an active participant in the civic realm as well as our call to love and worship God? Yeah, so I think the one informs the other. The better we are in, in honoring the call or the vocation or the job or the responsibility of worshiping God and being his child, uh, the better we are at having Uh, at being a good steward and a good citizen of our country. Our country should look at the Christians in our nation, even though we're dwindling away uh, in numbers, and they should see our our impact increase. They should see Christians as the best citizens in this country. They're the ones who are least likely to riot and complain. They're the ones who are most likely to pay their taxes. They're the ones who are most likely to um, sign up to go and fight for just wars. If there are just wars that, that we're called to fight, they should be the ones who are the best at caring for the widow, caring for the orphan, to the point where welfare programs should be totally redundant and not even needed in our country. Um, but 
you know, we don't we don't necessarily see that. So yeah. there there's a a calling that if we are, if we take seriously um, our relationship with God, it should inform the way we live our lives in society for the good. Okay, so obeying the laws of the land uh, again, another uh, aspect of our civic responsibility that that people should see us as. And that's just where it starts, right? If, yeah. if we're breaking the laws, then we're being really bad citizens. Following the law should be the, the barrier to entry. It should be the yeah. bare minimum that we do. Then we should seek ways which we can go even above and beyond simply following the laws to actually working for the good of the citizens of this country, yeah. for our neighbors, for our friends, for people, for foreigners, for those who are oppressed, all these pe people groups that we keep talking about, how Christians have a responsibility to them. It's certainly, it's going above and beyond. But that's what Christians have always done, and that's yeah. what we're called to do today. Yeah. Another way we talk about that, and we've talked about it in the past, is that we are citizens of two kingdoms. Mm -hmm. So we have the, the left-handed kingdom, which is the kingdom of the world, uh, that God uses government to lead and direct and to lay down laws that we should follow so that we live at peace mm -hmm. uh, with those around us. And we also have the right-handed kingdom, which is the kingdom of the church. And it not only has God's directives and laws, but more importantly, it has his, or just, uh, more importantly, <laughs> it has that grace and mercy of mm -hmm. God that needs to be uh, applied in our life. Uh, again, first and foremost with God, as yep. we recognize that we're sinful human beings, uh, mm -hmm. but also the, the opportunity to apply that grace and mercy to other people. Absolutely. So, um, so we live in these two kingdoms uh, as we love God and, and love and serve our neighbor. And so, um, so what, is, what is the history about the role of Christian um, the role of Christians in providing welfare for our neighbors? Uh, uh, what can we learn from that? Yeah, I think that that's, if you go to the early church, that is the, the primary reason um, why the Christian church succeeded to the point where it's a global church today is that people in the early uh, era of the Christian church would go, these Christians are weird, but they're weird in like a good way. They do things that other people don't do. They take care of the people that society forgets. They go out of their way um, to, to pool money to make sure that the least of the people in their organization are well taken care of. Um, they're the ones doing, f making hospitals and starting uh, universities to ensure that people are educated and they're the ones who are, um, who are raising money to, to fund um, you know, welfare programs in the nations in which they are in. To help orphans and... Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, others in the others and thing. aliens mm -hmm. and and foreigners that come into our country, yep. um, all of those things have been um, what Christians have done throughout the history of the world. Yep. Sometimes we do it better than other times, but mm -hmm. that's again what we're called to do. Yep. And um, well, I think we always try to attain to the example of the earliest days of the church because that was really when they were the best at it. They, um, the, I forget the exact passages, I think it's in Acts chapter 3 that they, um, they shared everything in common and they cared for each other. Like, um, they, um, they lived out the creed er, and the mantra that um, they, were, they were one holy church. They were working together for the, for the good of each other and to bring others who, e who weren't even Christians um, to, to um, care for them so that they would ask the question, what is it with these Christians? And, then they, and when they're asked the question, what is it with you guys that's causing you to do all this? They'll say, let me talk to you about my Christ. <laughs> and that's, that's really the, the strongest mission work we can do uh, isn't going into the world and just trying to um, tell everybody about Jesus. One of the strongest things we can do is to, to make them ask why we're doing what we're doing, all the good things that we're doing. And then we can... And after the, establishing, and the door is open. Yeah, after establishing that relationship of love, that door is open. And now when you share Jesus with them, they're like, oh, yeah, I can totally see that written over all over everything that you've done and said since I've known you. And so that makes a lot of sense. And now I want to know more about it. And they're hungry to learn about Jesus. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So what does uh, today we see all kinds of government programs, uh, especially over the last number of years, and what does that say about the calling of Christians to live up to that vocation of helping our neighbor? Um, I, I mentioned it earlier. If Christians were living out um, 
their kind of third use of the law of life where they were doing living life the way that God wanted us to live. We, none of us can live it perfectly, but if we did it better, if we considered the needs of others more, if we, if we lived out that care for the widow, the orphan, for those who are sick, for those who are poor, there would be no need for our taxes to pay for all these, these different welfare programs or even, you know, Medicaid, Medicare, or uh, any of these programs, you name it, like, because Christians would be taking care of it within the society. There would be no need for um, any of these things. We obviously um, have all of these programs because there, there have been people who have slipped through the cracks um, and more and more as time has gone on to the point where um, there wasn't sufficient care being met out for those who were least in our society and so the government had to start putting into place all these programs to make sure that people weren't, uh, you know, weren't suffering. And yeah, there's also the political side of it. If I can if I can give five bucks to somebody to help them through the hard time, guess who they're going to vote for in the fall, right? Um, there's that as well. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's people that think that government is the answer to everything mm -hmm. just because they don't know about the Christian values that we have. Yep. And so sometimes people want the government to take care of certain people in need uh, because they don't want to. Mm -hmm. um, so it tells us, one, that there, there are still people all around us that are in need. Um, Christians don't always do everything that we can. Uh, that should always be what we strive for, but we don't always do that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people think that the government is the answer uh, to fixing the, the problems that we have in our society. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the end result is there is still much work to be done yep. to, uh, to help people in need, to reach out to them, uh, to share Christ's love with them, and, and if there's an opportunity to share the hope that we have in Christ as well. Yep. Yeah. So that deals with civic responsibility, but we also want to talk about Christian freedom. And uh, so there's a, a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, that talks about Christian freedom. Paul was writing uh, to the church at Corinth, and um, there was a lot of questions that they were asking of him, and, and so he kind of summed it up uh, with these words. He said, I have the right to do anything as a Christian, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Mm -hmm. And so Luther kind of made a, a, a similar comment in one of his works, uh, talking about the, the freedom of the Christian. And um, uh, do you want to share with kind of yeah. uh, the meaning of... of yeah, uh, he, he, he did a, a work called On the Freedom of a Christian, and one of the statements that he used that I think summarizes this well is he says that a Christian man is the most free Lord of all and subject to none, but then at the same time he said a Christian man is the most dutiful servant of all and subject to anyone and everyone. So it's this idea that we have the freedom to call, consider ourselves lords and to and to uh, go our own way and do our own thing. We have that freedom as Christians. We've been set free um, from the authority and the power, the strict authority and the strict power of the law to some degree um, because Jesus has set us free from that when he died on the cross. Yet we intentionally choose to place ourselves under the law because we know that that's honoring what God wants for our lives and it calls us into that quorum mundo, that horizontal righteousness between us and our neighbor and the world around us. And so Christians don't love and serve their neighbor because it makes them look better in the eyes of God, but rather we do it because we've been set free. But it's not to do just, that work. It's not the question of uh, have we been set free from responsibility. Really what it is is we've been set free we, to, to be, in order to be, be and do the things that God has given us to do. So and to share that love that Christ first shared with us. Yep. And so how does this, how does this uh, understanding of Christian freedom differ from the type of freedom that we talk about, uh, or at least often talk about here in America, mm -hmm. uh, as we talk about being free as an American? Yeah, so freedom is one of the, the central things when you ask what's most important about American culture, you might get freedom as one of the top answers, but we don't really understand freedom like the way that the Bible does. We understand freedom as being separated from a tyranny, right, and, and taking our own freedom 
freedom and our own liberty into our own hands. Kind of stemming from our early days as a nation where we were declaring independence and freedom from um, the empire of Great Britain. So we have, uh, we have this sort of different uh, way of looking at things in the Christian faith. Is Certainly we are free, but it's a different kind of freedom. As we said, it's not freedom from an oppressive king or overlord or system of government. It's freedom that sets us free to live out a life which is pleasing to God and honors our neighbors. And so uh, I think when we, when we talk about freedom, like for example, when we have services on the 4th of July, for example, we have to make this distinction that when we're talking about freedom, we're, not, we're, we're bringing it up as a topic because it's 4th of July and all of our minds are on freedom, but it's a different kind of yeah. freedom. It's a different aspect to it. And the greatest bondage that we had was the bondage into sin. Bondage of sin, mm-hmm. and that's what God has set us free from. Yep. Um, something that we could never have done on our own, mm-hmm. uh, but Christ and his love for us came to live and dwell among us and to set us free by becoming a sacrifice for us, by dying on the cross, uh, so that we might be freed. And he not only took our sin upon himself, but he covers us with his very righteousness as he makes us one of God's own children. Yep. And so from we have been set free from sin and death and Satan, mm-hmm. and now we are free to not only love God, but to love our neighbor and to share the good gifts that God has given to us uh, with those around us. I forget the exact passage, but I know there is a Bible verse, and I think it's from Paul. It says, it is for freedom that you have been set free. And it, it, that sounds confusing at first until you identify the two different types of freedom we're talking about here. It is for the sake of that freedom to serve and to love other people. That's the reason why God has set us free from sin. You've been set free so that you can be free people and do free things. Okay, so how should Christians act politically regarding issues that God uh, may not be specific about? So he may not give a, a very... Uh, exact command about a certain thing like he does about do not take a person's life. Mm-hmm. Um, what about other topics? Um, how, should we, how should we deal with those issues? Well, I think this is where Paul enters into the equation. We started with reading 1 Corinthians 6. He says he has the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. So as Christians, we have the right to vote any way we want to on these issues where God doesn't speci- specifically speak in the Bible, but not every way of voting that God doesn't specifically speak to would be beneficial in every way to our neighbor or to the future, to our children, to future generations. Um, And so we have to still use that discernment and that wisdom and try to do the best we can to analyze whatever political issue or or, uh, amendment or um, candidates, positions or platforms uh, and try to consider to the best of our abilities using our discernment what is the most in line with what God's plan would be. So let's, let's take it down to, uh, we've got an amendment that's coming up, amendment number two mm. that's gonna be voted on. Yeah, so amendment two is an, is an interesting one. And it's one at first you say, so it's on the topic of the new lottery um, that they're incorporating or planning to incorporate uh, for the s- sake of increasing funding to schools. Yeah. Okay, so th- here's, here's a good example. Did God ever say, thou shalt not incorporate a lottery into yeah. your, it's like, not, yeah. not really. He's got some things about gambling, but it's less about the gambling and more about idolatry. Um, and, and hey, man, we like, we like giving money to kids and education in school. That seems like a pretty noble thing to do. Yeah. But when you utilize your discernment, you have to kind of say, is this really something that it, when you get, dig into the details that would be honoring to God? So, what, what, what are your opinions on it? Yeah, Let's talk about it. So, um, so one of the things that I understand is that uh, a certain amount of the funds, it's first of all betting on different sports teams. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there, for me, it's one question of stewardship. Is that the best use of uh, how God would use, have us use uh, the finances that he's given us? Um, uh, or would it be better to say if, if schools are in need of, funds, wouldn't it be better to raise taxes so that they get the money they need to do the things that they, uh, they need to do? Um, that would be my preference. Um, um, also recognizing that gambling can be uh, something that is uh, uh, an addictive habit. A vice. Uh, mm-hmm. A vice that can, that can bring people to ruin. Mm-hmm. Um, 
that certainly is a, a concern as well. Um, I also understand that within the law that uh, they can use uh, a certain amount of that for their own uh, administrative type activity. Mm -hmm. So uh, while they've been saying that all these funds will be going to schools, uh, schools may not receive as much of those funds. In fact, it could even happen where schools don't even receive any of those funds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so from, from my perspective, again, that, that seems a little deceptive. Yeah. And um, from, from just a, a higher level, not, not digging too deep into the actual wording of the legislation, you can ask the question, God certainly can use evil or vices to do good, but should we institutionalize a, the utilizing of a vice for the sake of funding a virtue? And I think that would be a pretty clear no. We, we would see that God would not um, want us as Christians to prey on the, the weaknesses and the vices of people that are our neighbors uh, and take from them for the sake of giving to somebody else. So I think mm -hmm. when, you, when you start to look at it from the perspective of like, what would God say if he was standing right here today and we were starting to talk about the, the relationship that we have with the people in, in our society around us. It seems like, the, you know, they try and, and fluff it up like, do it for the kids. Do it for the, it's not about yeah. the kids as much as what it is, is they're trying to leverage a vice that's already there and allow people to grow into that a little more. And then, by the way, we'll take money off yeah. of that to it, give to... Yeah. For, for a great cause yeah. for, for teaching our kids. Yeah. And so. uh, it, it sounds good, but there's a lot of undercurrents that can be destructive to people and families. So our, our Pastor Doug and Pastor Scott condemning those who would vote yes on that amendment? Mm -hmm. not, not necessarily. Once again, you have Christian freedom here. God, I don't think, specifically speaks on this issue. Mm -hmm. But we would probably advise you that if you dug a little deeper on this issue, you could see how it, you could clearly find some direction from God's word that might help you to better interpret what is going on. Yeah. yeah. So, but a very applicable uh, uh, um, illustration mm -hmm. as that's uh, one of the items that we'll be voting on in this upcoming election. Yep. So, um, um, so how should, how does our understanding of Christian freedom then guide our words and actions? Uh, that's, what living is. I mean, we, we have this, I, this understanding, this, this Christian freedom is, is part of who we are and what we do. We've been set free for freedom's sake. Um, so we have to live out in our words and our actions um, that Christian freedom um, every day. So we, we vote that way. We serve others in that way. We teach our kids in that way of freedom. And we uh, certainly um, when, we're, when we're wrestling with ideas where God doesn't specifically speak on those ideas, we're still using his word to try and guide our, our decisions and our direction. Yeah, and it's, it's important to understand um, uh, and consider where other people have come from mm -hmm. and what their needs are. Um, how can we help them? How can we encourage them? And that may not always be a handout, but uh, it might be an opportunity for um, teaching or equipping or training them in some way to use their own skills yeah. uh, in a way that will benefit them throughout the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the, you know, I look at our, our church body, the, our Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and, and we, are, uh, um, we have strong ties to the teaching profession and, and we want to encourage uh, to teach and equip people um, uh, in ways that, where they can live out their life for the good of their neighbor. Yeah. Um, it's a part of who we are and what we do. Um, so how should, there are, other, there are other topics that we want to talk about, some specific things. Um, how should we approach, uh, whether it's uh, paying taxes or gun, gun control, climate change? Let's yeah, talk easy about, ones, yeah, easy yeah, ones. let's talk about some of these. Well, this once again, does God speak clearly on tax policy? He does speak on taxes, right? Yeah. Rendering to Caesar that which is Caesar's. But does he say, it's, a, it's an evil to raise taxes on people. No, not necessarily. Matter of fact, so, 
it's, it's condoned in a lot of cases. Um, with gun control, I mean, we, he didn't, there weren't guns back then, but you could just say, does God condone the utilizing of, of weapons for self-defense in, in the home? I would say, yeah, he, he yeah. does in some places. Re- responsible, responsibly yep. uh, being a responsible owner of... Within, of with, I think you could say that utilization of weapons within vocation, within God ordained vocations like being a police officer being a soldier being a parent protecting a home um, I think those are all condoned um, examples Uh, now once again though God doesn't specifically speak and say gun equals evil gun equals good the same way he does with other issues so we have to utilize our Christian freedom and our ability to process um, his will and discern his will um, a little bit and then climate change is another one. I mean, um, I think uh, that this is a pretty clear divide along party lines, whether we say, y- you know, we need to be doing more for climate change or does climate change even exist, right? And so we have people who believe across the spectrum in different things, even within the church. Mm-hmm. So how do we utilize our Christian freedom there and, and look at God's word? Well, God does call us to be good stewards of this earth. That's mm-hmm. why we were created in the first place. Adam and Eve were to tend the garden and be fruitful and multiply as well as to help the earth to do so as well. And that, that um, has not changed. We're still the, um, the ones who are caretakers of his creation. Uh, and uh, so we do have a responsibility to it. Yet, however, I think that it has gone to the, to the extent that where sometimes the earth itself can become an idol, which can um, take cause the us place of take God. the place of God or interfere with the way in which we're loving and serving our neighbor. And so we have to mm-hmm. find a, a good balance there that's, that's biblical where we say, well, we're not just going to go dumping toxic waste anywhere we want to in the world, nor are we going to um, castigate people who don't uh, remove all the plastic things from their soda containers or whatever. You know, it's somewhere mm-hmm. in the middle is where we want to be. We want to be the ones who... Um, are good advocates for, for stewardship of this earth and are also at the same time um, uh, there to support and build people up, not tear people down. Yeah. And so does the, the Bible suggest that God has a specific type of government? Um, so we can, uh, so maybe the short answer to that is... Is no. Okay. But he did yeah. establish a government. Okay. <laughs> with his people in Israel for that context, for that time. When they first yeah. came into the land of Israel and they first settled there, God had a system of government that he helped them establish where he was the... And their government actually changed over time. It did, yes. He was the sovereign and he had these people to adjudicate amongst the people to to utilize his word as the sort of law, the constitution that set what was right, what was wrong and how to judge between people. And they lived that way for for generations. So looking at some of the different styles of government in the Old Testament, mm-hmm. at one time Moses was the key ruler and leader. Yeah, he was of basically God's an people. autocrat. What he said pretty much went. He did have a, a sort of an elder council who would gather mm-hmm. and, and receive communication from Moses and then take it out into the tribes, but it was still very much uh, like what I say goes kind of thing. Yeah, and Moses Moses received the Ten Commandments mm-hmm. from God. Uh, later on, they had judges mm-hmm. that ruled over the people. Later on after that, they had kings mm-hmm. um, uh, as well as um, prophets and priests that also dealt with um, not necessarily maybe the government governmental side of things, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, the prophets always spoke God's word in to both kings and to the religious leaders, yep. but they also had priests um, that would lead the people in teaching them how to worship God and, and love those around them. Yep. And so what, what, about, um, what about our democracy uh, here in the United States? Yeah, does God think that democracy is the best form of government? I think that... Um, I've heard the kind of joke that uh, um, democracy, uh, democracy, how how does it go? It's like democracy is um, only the least worst version of government we've come up with yet. (laughs) Um, It's not perfect. It's never intended to be, but it kind of has the ability um, to at some point facilitate Christians in living out their vocations to love their neighbor the best that we've come up with kind of so far. Yeah. Um, democracies can, can devolve into um, 
sort of celebrating the most popular person in a, in a kingdom, or in a, I almost said kingdom, I didn't mean kingdom, in a nation, and then they can kind of become elevated to this sort of um, dictatorial kind of realm. That's happened in almost every democracy that we've seen over a long period of time. It's happened in Greece, it happened in Rome, it's happened in other places in Europe, and you could say there's becoming more and more uh, tilting towards populism in our country where instead of truly being uh, like a representative democracy, we're kind of more of like a uh, selection of those people who rise to the top and you got two options of which guy is going to be in charge. Um, So the democracy is not really um, each person has a voice. What it really is is here's your two choices. Which one are you going to take? Yeah. Um, uh, Another positive about democracy is that it's, it's actually by the people and for the people. Mm-hmm. So we, we decide as we work together. Uh, a danger is that sometimes people don't want to get involved yeah. and they, they step away from uh, a responsibility of, of helping the process. Yeah, after the Constitutional Convention, whenever John Adams came out of uh, the hall, um, some people asked him, what form of government have you developed for us, Mr. Adams? And he said, a democracy if you can keep it. <laughs> and uh, that, that is exactly yeah. true. Democracies are only as good as the people voting because if they're uneducated or if they're prone to... Um, or if know, they're uninvolved. Or they're uninvolved or if they're prone to uh, go away from virtuousness and righteousness to sort of demagoguery and, and whatever, you know, if they, if, they, if they legislate to their own stomach and their own comforts rather than to the overall good of the country, then it, then it turns real bad real fast because it's just, there's no other vehicle which can, can backslide so fast because we have elections every four years and we can mm-hmm. legislate unto ourselves our own destruction. Yeah, there, there's other forms of government <clears throat> such as socialism or communism. Yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, again, each one has pros and cons, mm. but... Um, but God doesn't prescribe one kind of government yeah. um, for people of the world. Yeah, I would say that um, the, the socialism and communism thing, I, there's probably a lot of people who would say, what, what possible good is there in that? Well, you, even, you do have examples of the New Testament church where they gave everything to the collective and they lived together. So that's not communism, really. What that is is uh, voluntary yeah. communism, right? They, communism is not voluntary. It's where the the country uh, and the leaders in the country and the people with the guns and the money say, all right, everyone throw your money in now. We're all going to get along. Um, that's, I don't think, a, a thing that's, um, that God would want us to do is to take other if, people's money and pool it for the good of the nation forcefully. Yeah. Um, he yeah. would say it's good for people in the church to um, be generous with their money for the sake of those who are the least yeah. of these. But to institutionalize it and put guns behind it and to remove um, the and choice. It, and to it do often it. benefits primarily those who are the higher, in, higher up in, mm-hmm. in government. Yeah. yeah. So there are, there are real pr- pratfalls to those as well. Yeah. So there's uh, challenges throughout our life to. Uh, to live in this world, be people of two kingdoms. Um, and yet God is very clear. Again, I, I, I love the idea that God created both kingdoms. Mm-hmm. God himself rules over both kingdoms. We talked about it, that in our first, first time that we met. And he invites us to be involved in both kingdoms. Mm-hmm. And, um, and there's opportunities all around us uh, to love and serve God and to love and serve our neighbor each and every day. Yeah. And that's what he calls us to do. But it, it calls for discernment and wisdom and uh, patience and understanding to do that. Yep. So, so that brings us to the end of this, this third topic, uh, the issues God cares about. And we have one more uh, time next, next week. Mm-hmm. And uh, we hope you, you join us for that. Um, any closing comments that you have? No, I just hope you come back for that. We're going to kind of wrap up the series. And then I think after that, we're going to take a little bit of a break for a while okay. and kind of recharge our batteries. We've got the, you know, the Thanksgiving season in November. There's also the election season. So we would love to hear your comments related to this stuff we're talking about. 
in, in the election that's upcoming. Um, but uh, we'll, yeah, we will take a little break and uh, be back maybe in the, in the new year sometime uh, or relatively early. We'll do that. So. Very good, very good. Well, let's close with prayer if you bow your heads All with right. me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and your promise. We thank you for your love uh, that, uh, first of all, has uh, chosen us and uh, to be your people. Uh, you have freed us from sin and death and Satan. Uh, you have allowed us uh, to live in this freedom, uh, not so that we live for ourselves, but so that we live for our neighbor and that we love those around us and, and look out for their best interests. Uh, help us to live in such a way that uh, we care for those around us and we demonstrate your love to them. We ask, Lord, that you always open our eyes to help us see what you're doing so we can join you in that work. We thank you for being with us here today and again for your word and your spirit that guides and directs us. Uh, so bless us this day. Uh, be with us as we get closer to our elections. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, work things out according to your purposes and plan. And so we commend that and ourselves to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us today. Have a great day in the Lord, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.